Good morning, good afternoon, and uh, good evening. Uh, welcome to our first Youth Lead Ambassador webinar of the Core 3. I am Efren Bakala, an Atlas Core Fellow and the Youth Engagement Fellow for Youth Power to Learning and Evaluation Projects at Making Sense International. Today, uh, four of my colleagues from Making Sense International and two Youth Lead Ambassadors have joined me for the webinar. Help share the information more widely on Twitter and Facebook. Today, uh, our ambassadors have joined us for a, 60, for a total of 60 minutes presentation. And we will start by introducing our team members and our youth lead ambassadors. Uh, then we'll share some information about youth power to learning and evaluation and the youth lead ambassadorship program. Next, our speakers uh, will talk about early childhood education and literacy in West Africa, specifically in Ghana and Nigeria. And they will talk about the root causes of the problem and how they are addressing the issue and also with uh, possible recommendations from their side. Once they finish their presentation, uh, we will open the floor for question and answer. And finally, I'll come back to share information on how to join Youth Lead and also uh, find that would be the final session. I'll give it to Sarah. Next slide, please. Thanks, Ephraim. And hi, everyone. Welcome and thank you again for joining us. My name is Sarah Slayton, and I'm the Senior Youth Engagement Advisor for YP2LE and Making Sense International. And in addition to Ephraim, we're also joined by our team members, Gloria Schultz, who's the Senior Associate of Communications, and Cole Simcoe, also a Senior Associate, who is helping manage the technical aspect of today's event. And in addition to those present, we also have a full team that supports YP2LE in communications, project and knowledge management under the direction of Christy Scott. So we just wanna give you a sense of the team behind the project YP2LE. Before we dive into this morning's webinar, we also wanna give you a little bit more background about Youth Power 2 Learning and Evaluation or YP2LE for short. YP2LE is supported by Youth Power, a USA funding mechanism for youth focused programs, evaluation and research. And the goal of YP2LE is to generate knowledge and promote learning on positive youth development or PYD. If you're not familiar with PYD, it's a holistic framework for youth development. And it assumes that all young people have assets that should be invested in through inclusion, access, education, and training. The framework also promotes youth agency that can be best supported by an enabling environment for young people, such as strong youth networks, supportive adults, youth-friendly services and resources, and youth-friendly policies. YouthLead.org, which serves young changemakers, and YouthPower.org, which is focused on youth-serving organizations, are both supported by the YP2LE project, and they're designed to connect our community and share resources and learning on PYD. If you'd like to learn more about PYD, we encourage you to visit YouthPower.org or YouthLead.org. And to tell you more about YouthLead.org, I'm gonna turn it back over to Ephraim. So YouthLead.org was launched at the 2018 World Bank Youth Summit. And today it includes more than 12,000 members uh, from around the world. The platform is a global hub for young people aged between 15 and 35 who are working for positive change and impact in their communities as advocates, activist, act, activists, uh, volunteers, and entrepreneurs. And any young change maker can join the site by creating its own profile. And once you are a member and once you have a profile, you can also access uh, different resources. Uh, and at the same time, you can, you can share those resources for other young people who are in the network. And also you can, uh, you can also network with other peer, uh, peer leaders like you and join the online discussion and stay up to date uh, on opportunities and events. For example, today's webinar has been, uh, have been promoted and also will be saved on the site. YouthLead.org provides similar network for uh, your own work. You can explore many resources for your projects and also work, and even uh, get funding for projects by applying to different calls. I will share more about the Youth Lead site and how to join and the benefits uh, at the end of this session. So keep that one in mind. So the picture you are seeing right now on the screen uh, is consists of our current Youth Lead ambassadors from different parts of the world. They have represented more than 20 countries, uh, mainly from Africa, Asia, South and Central America. And this is the third cohort of the Youth Lead Ambassador Program. 
and about 3,000 young change makers applied for the ambassadorship role. And we have selected uh, over 20 young change makers as a youth lead ambassadors. The ambassadors are sharing information about youth lead uh, with their networks and also increasing engagement with youth leads through discussion groups on the site. Uh, they also engage on social media and now also by sharing their experience through uh, webinars, just like today's. For the current cohort, this is the first of the series of webinars led by the youth lead ambassadors. And today our speakers are joining us from Ghana in Nigeria. So on the left side, you see our current youth lead ambassador, Janet, from Ghana, currently a youth lead ambassador for the Youth Power to Learning and Evaluation Program. She is a youth empowerment activist in Ghana. She is the founder of uh, Zoetix Global, a social enterprise uh, that provides skill training for youth in Ghana. She's, current, she's currently the project manager for Arise Educational Foundation in Ghana, which she will be talking more about later today. And she served as, a, as the selection director for the youth, for the Young African Leaders Initiative Al Munai uh, of Ghana Association from 2019 to 2020. Uh, on the right side, you see Oladi, Oladi Meji, uh, who's joining us from Nigeria. He's also a youth lead ambassador for the YP2LE program. He's a graduate of Lagos University and he's a management consultant, uh, edu, edupreneur, and also a uh, resident from SDG advocate. Through the Excel Minds platform, which he will be talking about more later, he founded back he founded the Excel Minds in 2017. He advances SDG4, which is quality education, and the platform currently uh, caters for academic welfareism of uh, over 10,000 members. Oladi Meji uh, is always open to new challenges and opportunities. So, uh, welcome our ambassadors and also our participants. Uh, on the next slide, I'll give it to Janet who's going to start the presentation for today. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Ephraim, for that introduction. I'm really excited to be here. So I think we should just get straight to it. Um, let's start with some interesting facts about early childhood education in Ghana. As you can see on your screen, we've collected these facts from UNICEF, Statista, and UN data. So apparently 37.1% of Ghana's entire population is made up of children aged from zero to 14 years. This indicates that majority of pre-primary age students falls within this bracket. Now more than 400,000 students are not enrolled in pre-primary education as compared to an estimated of 35,000 children who are, not enrolled in pre who are not enrolled in primary schools. So if we have to analyze this, we understand that about 92% of pre-primary age children are not enrolled in school as compared to elementary school age children. So this is a major problem to consider when it comes to Ghana. Next slide, please. Okay, so I'll give this to Shotunde to briefly tell us the statistics in Nigeria. Yeah, thank you very much, um, Janet, for bringing me on board. Yes, based on the statistics we have on our screen, it's highly you know, interesting to note that one in every five of the world's house of school, um, school children is in Nigeria. And what this signifies is basically that uh, Nigeria is more or less like the headquarter of illiteracy in the world, in as much as that might sound funny, but that is just the reality. And of course, um, from what you can see on your screen, we also have some statistics that talks about the um, illiteracy rates in Nigeria. You know, of course, you can see that. But there's something very much peculiar about the statistics we have on our screen, which is about the northeastern part of Nigeria. Of course, it is a crisis prone area, and as such, illiteracy is slightly higher when you know compared with other parts of the country. But hopefully, when I get to my presentation, I'm going to shed more light on what it, um, on what um, the northeastern part of Nigeria and other part of Nigeria are really doing to curb literacy and what we can also recommend as we take ambassadors. Thank you, Janet. All right, thank you so much, Shotunde, for giving us the statistics. Okay, so next slide, please. Great, so you might be asking yourself, what's the importance of early childhood education? What at all does it mean to have early childhood education? Next slide, please. Great, so there are so many importance to early childhood education that cannot be overlooked. Among them is social, cognitive, and physical development. We understand that children learn to interact with others, regulate their own behavior. They usually identify their individuality as part of a community. 
they begin to perceive, process information, develop growth and fine motor skills as well. Now, according to a research that was done by National Library of Medicine in 2016, early childhood education increases high graduation rates and has a tendency to reduce special education placement. Now we know that this importance of early childhood education cannot be overlooked and therefore there's a need that every child have access to early childhood education in West Africa. Next slide, please. Great, so let's look at some problem analysis um, when it comes to early childhood education and let's find out some of the major causes, the root causes to these problems in um, when it comes to early childhood education and literacy in Ghana and in Nigeria, which are a bit similar though. So let's look at some of them. Next slide, please. Great, so you might be asking, what is early childhood education at all? So according to Wikipedia, early childhood education relates to teaching of children from birth up to the age of eight. It's usually consists of activities or experiences that are intended to affect developmental changes in children prior to their entry into elementary school. So here in Ghana, we have nursery and kindergarten. We also have the crèche, but that's, that level is usually not included in the gap. We usually consider the nursery and kindergarten when it comes to Ghana. Next slide, please. Great, so let's look at a problem tree analysis of early childhood education. So the problem here is that a lot of children have been deprived the opportunity to have access to quality early childhood education in Ghana. Now, the big question is, why is this problem persisting over the years? It's because some of the causes to this problem has not been mitigated. Now, these causes were gathered as a result of research that we did on our project and series of other research we conducted here in Ghana. So one of the major causes to this problem is poverty. Here in Ghana, when people are going through difficult conditions, especially when it has to do with financial constraints, they tend to you know, not see the need of spending money on taking their kids to school from the age of two to five. They would rather keep them in the house or take them to the street to sell with them or something. They don't really consider it very important when they're going through difficult conditions. Another aspect is also cycle of achievement. Now, we all can clarify with this that there's a tendency of parents who are highly educated to send their children to school as compared to parents who are illiterate or have very level, very low level of education. So this really makes it difficult and is considered as part of the causes to the problem currently at hand. Another issue is inadequate support from the government. And then we have a um, limited number of trained educators as well. Now, all these courses also have a reflection on literacy, which we will see as we move forward with this presentation. The effects are very, very negative and bad, as we can see. It's increased the rate of illiteracy and delayed development in children. And in the long run, it has effect on our educational system and affects and increases the rate of illiteracy in Ghana. And this is also quite similar to Nigeria. Shotunde will show more lights on that for us. Next slide, please. So the inability to read or write has been influenced by several factors in Ghana. Some of the major causes being poverty, as explained earlier, cycle of educational achievement, school dropouts as a result of teenage pregnancy, and other learning disabilities that is also poses a threat to the cause or the effects that affects illiteracy in Ghana. So I explained poverty in the previous slide and that of cycle of achievement, school dropouts, which is usually as a result of teenage pregnancy. When kids, um, especially when it comes to the ladies, when they get pregnant, they, they are really shy to continue in school. So they eventually give up with that. And we have learning disabilities that allows people, that prevents people from being able to read or write. So naturally, when you don't have good educators who can guide these people, it becomes a problem. So these are some of the major causes based on research in communities that we have conducted um, our projects. And um, these are some of the causes we're able to come up with. So now this is the exciting part for me. How am I addressing early childhood education in Ghana and in my community? So I work as a project lead and an educational manager for Arise Educational Foundation. Our aim is to empower deprived children to acquire, demonstrate and articulate knowledge and skills that will support them to become responsible. Great, so our project-based community is deprived from access to adequate 
quality early childhood education. Majority of the people living in this community are fishermen or petty traders. Irrespective of it's nice beaches that I can tell to a fact that is really nice, that attract a lot of tourists. Illiteracy is high and most children aged two to eight years are usually not enrolled in school. So one of the things that I have learned on my project throughout my experience in my current projects is that I have a good understanding of importance of engaging in community research to find out root causes of educational issues and how one can design needful solutions towards them. I believe this is key if we want to combat illiteracy in communities and also provide support for early childhood education. So what I do at my work is also concerned um, concerning development of curriculum. And I believe that a good curriculum evolves, it adapts to educational activities to meet the need of a modern and dynamic community. I believe that teaching methodologies should be of problem-based and evidence-based learning. Technology must be adopted in the process of learning. We must consistently engage students on hands-on experiences with value-based routines that encourages students to learn as well. So this is a typical example of how we allow children to explore by offering them a platform to be innovative and creative. So for example, we encourage our students to build design storage devices with plastics. And also sometimes we ask them, draw what you see around them, which gives them the platform to be very creative and explore their innovativeness as well. So one of the important aspects in this whole um, in this whole process of mitigating illiteracy is about educators. We cannot take them out of the equation. It is important that we give consistent training to educators. So over here with my project, we consistently train our teachers in application of new knowledge in practice, self-directed learning strategies, classroom management, teaching approaches such as game-based learning, differentiated instruction, and many more. Educators play important role in mitigating illiteracy and supporting early childhood education. Therefore, they need to ensure they are resourceful enough to be part of this process. We can't leave them behind. If not, it affects what we are trying to achieve in terms of our purpose. Involving stakeholders is very important. As we always say that education is key. If people do not have a clear understanding of the importance of literacy and early childhood education, it will be almost impossible to have them involved. So what we do here is that we continuously engage all stakeholders to take keen interest in literacy. So um, we talk about parents, we talk about guardians, we talk about community leaders, we talk about educators. All of these people must be involved in the process of mitigating illiteracy and supporting early childhood education. Next slide, please. So what are some of my recommendations when it comes to this topic? Next slide, please. Great. So in as much as we want to talk about the government, we can't also take out youth leaders out of it. So we all have a role to play. This is a call to action in the process of mitigating challenges that come with illiteracy and lack of early childhood education. Governments must be prepared to monitor and evaluate implemented policies. So here in Ghana, we have the Department of Social Welfare, Ghana Education Service, National Youth Authority, all these agencies must be fully involved by contributing their quota towards early childhood education and combating illiteracy. Now, youth leaders must continue to advocate on the importance of early childhood education. Parents must equally play their role by cooperating with educators and the government in this journey. Educators must consistently learn to stay relevant in the process of teaching. So I believe that young people also need to involve themselves in the process of mitigating this problem, equally as the government must also play their role if we want to combat these issues. So this is exactly what we want to achieve, that every single child is excited about education. And this will not happen if you and I don't play our role and if the government also don't play their role. So this is a call to action that we make every child excited about education by providing them access to quality early childhood education and with all the necessary tools and with all the indicators that I've spoken about so far so that we can achieve a very happy you know, environment with children who are very excited to be educated as a way of mitigating literacy in Ghana, which reflects in West Africa and also when it comes to early childhood education. So I hope this call of action 
is taken into consideration and everybody will put in their best towards mitigating these challenges. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Janet, uh, for the presentation. Uh, now, um, Oladi will take us to Nigeria and he will be talking about illiteracy and also the connection to childhood education, early childhood education. Oladi, it's yours. Yes, thank you so much, Ephraim. Janet, that was a wonderful presentation, very insightful. And of course, it's going to be an interesting one because Nigeria and Ghana happens to share a lot of similarities. You know, when you spoke about um, causes of literacy, you spoke about poverty, you know, school dropout and stuff like that. And definitely that is also what we are observing in Nigeria. So yes, literacy in Nigeria. But let, let me start with this. Let me start by saying this. And I think I need to bring this into the consciousness of all stakeholders, particularly the government, that we must come to understand that education is a crucial sector. It is the crucial sector that stimulates critical thinking. Critical thinking is what would lead to innovation, and innovation is what would birth the much needed growth and development we want in our country and our society at large. So I intentionally started with this remark because over the years we have observed that government stakeholders they haven't given education, you know the attention it deserves. So please, um, next slide. Yes. So to start with, what are the um, driving factors, you know, that leads to the I? Okay, let, let me start by saying this, that I think at, at the beginning, we said something that one in every five children in the world, that is one in every five of the world's out of school children are in Nigeria. And I said something that what that automatically signifies is that Nigeria is more or less like the literacy capital of the world. We shouldn't forget that according to a report by CNN and of course the World Bank, Nigeria was said to be the poverty capital of the world. And now recently, we are more or less like saying that Nigeria is the literacy capital of the world. So that's more or less like a twin challenge for Nigeria. So the question is, what are the driving factors behind you know, illiteracy in Nigeria? The first thing, of course, you can see budgetary allocation, policy, curriculum, professionals. And when we talk about professionals, we are referring to the teachers. But let me start with um, budgetary allocation. When it comes to funding, it, the, the funding um, uh, mechanism adopted in Nigeria is very, very poor. Let me, let me make reference to the budget. Um, I, in 2020, Nigeria allocated, I think, 6.7% of, you know, of, of the budget to education, just 6.7%. In 2021, instead of an increment, we observed a decrease, I guess perhaps maybe you know, premised on the COVID or what have you, 5.6% was allocated to education. This is way below the recommended UNESCO standard of between 15 to 26%. And that's very, very sad. But of course, we are getting there. Policy, Nigeria does not have clear cut policies to help address literacy. Curriculum, you wouldn't believe that in Nigeria today, we are still using curriculum that have been applicable in year 2000 in year 2005, in as much as that might sound funny. But the problem is that we have obsolete curriculum. One thing we must understand is, even if you get children to school and you are taking them, you know, using perhaps curriculum that are not contemporary, curriculum that are not, you know, telling the child what's happening out there, it's more or less like equivalent to illiteracy. So the curriculum we have in Nigeria, basically, one is obsolete. And secondly, the curriculum does not cater for native tongue. So right from scratch, these children are not exposed to how they can use their native tongue to get to understand all of these things. Then for the professionals, that is we're referring to teachers or what have you, there is a popular um, term in law, which is Nemo that could not abet. You can't give what you don't have. In Nigeria today, we have a lot of unqualified teachers out there that are you know, teaching these children. And you don't blame them. You know, the pay for teachers is very, very poor in Nigeria. And that alone, you know, does not incentivize people to want to take, to want to deliver quality education. So that's also a very, very big challenge. Next slide, please. So how I am addressing illiteracy. Yeah, next slide. Okay, now the exam is academic. I want to assume that there is a mix up, mix, up, uh, mix up in the slide. Yes, I was meant to see driving factors behind the literacy and of course recommendations. But of course, let's just move to how I am addressing literacy in Nigeria. If there's one thing I have, um, you know, understood about Nigeria, it is the fact that affordability is a major barrier to accessibility. Don't forget that what you cannot afford, definitely you cannot assess. 
And we, under the Examines Academic Group platform, we have come to understand this challenge. It's very much important that we acknowledge the fact that the government cannot do everything for us. It's going to be, it's meant to be a collaborative effort that is through private public sector partnership or what have you. So definitely we need the influx of private stakeholders into the educational sector to make things to work considering our population and everything. So in my individual capacity, what I do is we started the Examens Academic Platform back in January 2017. And what we do basically is that we offer free academic services to you know, students at no cost. We organize conferences, we organize trainings, you know, um, we organize free tutorials, compendiums and stuff like that, just to help students in the academics. Yeah, next slide, please. Okay, so basically you might be wondering that how do we you know carry out our activities what we do is that we identify the particular needs and realities of the target group because we don't just go out there to say that oh this is what we are doing or want to address um you know the literacy challenge in a particular location what we do is that we go there we make research what are the realities on ground what are the basic needs of of, of this particular target segment and having come to a realization or having of course identified the challenge then based on our assessment we help to provide this challenge. We help to um, sorry provide solutions to these challenges by offering our services in return, which are of course done pro bono. We have about 100 resource persons that help us in you know advancing quality education. They render their services for free without collecting nothing. And of course, to be sure that we are really having an impact on the society, we also adopted a feedback mechanism that can be used to get you know, part, um, participant testimonials just to be sure that they are gaining something from everything we have been doing. And we, we are glad that over the space of four years now, because it was established in 2017, we have been able to touch about 10,000 members and that is very much you know, commendable. Next slide, please. So now recommendations. Find beyond what we are doing under Excel Minds, beyond what we are seeing out there, what are the ways by which we can call the literacy in Nigeria? That should be the next question. What are those policy measures? What are those, you know, what are those measures we can bring in to help address literacy in Nigeria? Because the statistics are not really encouraging and definitely something urgent has to be done. Next slide, please. So the first is funding. But just before I talk about funding, we have to talk about the need for us to have sustainable solutions. It's very, very important. Anything we are doing, be it funding, be it curriculum, alternative energy, or what have you, there is a need for us to employ a sustainable approach because it's not it, it, it's not really logical for us to have something that will thrive for just six months, eight months, one year, and then you know it collapses. It doesn't make sense. So to funding, it is strongly recommended that government should increase the percentage that is being allocated to education in Nigeria. Because it doesn't, it, 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 it's, it's highly discouraging. Even in 2020, we have, um, what is it called, 6.7%. Um, and in 2021, we're having 5.6%, um, which is way below the recommended UNESCO standard of 15 to 26%. So there is a need for government to show much more intention by increasing the funding um, you know, allocated, that is by increasing, yes, the funding allocated to um, education. Then the curriculum, there is a need for us to review the curriculum, ensure that this curriculum, you know, I, I, I do say something that there is a distinction between a child going to school and a child really getting value from going to school. There are two different things. You know, you might just be going to school without getting value for education. So there is a need for us to be cautious, to check the curriculum, to be sure that this curriculum is really helping us to ameliorate the challenges of the society. And more importantly, we should also try to, you know, incorporate the native language because a report by UNESCO also reported that when you take a child using their native language, they tend to understand better than when you are using official languages. So this is one aspect that you know we can also look at critically. Then transparency. Yes, of course, it is no news that when it comes to corruption, Nigeria is out there in as much as I'm not trying to paint my country bad, but there is widespread corruption in Nigeria. So the thing is, beyond increasing the funding allocated to education, there should also be a mechanism to ensure that these funds are properly utilized for what they are or what they were initially um, you know, slated to um, achieve. Then alternative energy. This is a very interesting solution. You know, at the start of my presentation, I said something about the northeastern part of Nigeria, you know, being a crisis prone area, you know, those in underserved communities, rural communities or what have you. This is where government can come in. And what am I saying in essence? 
This is what we can do. In those crisis prone areas, such as the northeastern part of Nigeria, you know, states like Adamawa, you know, Yola, Bonu State, where they are having challenges of, you know, electricity, data, internet connectivity, and stuff like that, which of course also contributes to literacy. What we can do is that we can have solar powered devices. We have very odd sun in Nigeria. <laughs> so you can have solar powered um, you know, devices that would have been preloaded with offline resources. So by so doing, there will be no challenge of the um, so there will be no challenge of data constraints, um, you know, internet connectivity or what have you. So let us have is let, let's have the distribution of solar power devices to these um, you know, children, and in which all of these devices would have been preloaded or pre-stacked with offline resources, and that definitely will go a long way. And of course. We also spoke about you know partnership that is the private public sector partnership. I also said something that the government cannot do everything, and that is largely incontrovertible. That is one um, what is it called? That, that is one realization that we must come to terms with. So what we can do is in our individual confines. That's what we have NGOs here and there, and of course, at your minds, you know, everyone can come together towards you know helping the government in ameliorating the challenge of illiteracy, as we have seen from some of the statistics that have been dished out. Next slide, please. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Oladiji and Janet. Um, I think you've shared a good insight and also your daily experience regarding the childhood, the early childhood education and illiteracy in Ghana in Nigeria. I know these two countries are very big, and uh, I know you both have experience in the area. So uh, I have, I think, learned that. Um, you are not only facing the problem, but also you are part of the solution, which is uh, an exciting thing. And we have learned that uh, the role of the youth uh, and also decision makers, I would say, uh, in the area. And I was personally inspired by uh, Janet's creative space uh, from Arise and uh, all of these alternative energy options uh, from Excel Minds. So these are, I think, something I've learned today. Uh, and now I think it's time for um, to entertain questions uh, from our audience and also if they want, if you want to share your experience regarding the topic, uh, just to remind you once, uh, we're talking about um, early childhood education and illiteracy in West Africa, specifically in Ghana and Nigeria. So uh, I have one question for myself and also there was one question uh, from the audience. Uh, Hannah asked one question. Um, how effective and involved is the Department of Social Welfare when it comes to early childhood education? I think this goes to Janet. And she also added, is there any ongoing program at any uh, ministry that can allow for collaboration between the government and any job leading the realization of your recommendation? This was, I believe, a question for uh, Janet. And a question from myself to both of you is that, um, I'll take you to a time where, bef where before you started the project, Arise and Excel Minds. So what was one thing that changed the way you think about this problem or this issue? So after you started the project, after Janet, you started the Arise project, and Oladi, after you started Excel Minds, what was the one thing that you used to believe about early childhood education and uh, illiteracy, and what has changed after you uh, started implementing the, the solutions or different activities. I would love to uh, hear that one. And I believe our audience also would love, would love to hear that one. So I'll give it to Janet first, then, then Oladi. And also, I see Anita, you can, um, I'll give it to you after, uh, after this question is being answered. Thank you. Go ahead, Janet. Okay. All right, Ephraim, thank you so much for the question. So I will start with your last question. So before I started this project, I used to have this idea that kids must always sit in a classroom to learn. I didn't believe in the concept of using the outdoor space as a learning environment. But when I started you know, working with Arise and also doing some research and observations, I realized that education, when we talk about excellence academics, it's, it doesn't just stay within the classroom we should be able to move the kids out and let them blend with the environment. And as they try to play around, you know, move around and work together in groups, using the outdoor space as a learning environment, it can really be of good help. So that's one new thing 
I learned since I started this project. So it has changed my mindset initially. And so I, I really, I'm really excited about this new, new knowledge that I have. And so I'll speak to the next question, which has to do with social welfare, if I'm not mistaken, the involvement of social welfare in early childhood education. Okay, so um, from my experience on this project, their involvement at the district level is not too recommendable um, because when we started this project for like three years straight, we did not have anybody come in from social welfare to you know, assess the environment, check that we have all the necessary requirements in the classrooms and everything for the kids. So until we had to go to the office and then you know, get them to come in, nobody actually came, but they have the data because before you can establish a preschool in Ghana, there are procedures you have to go through. And one of the procedures you have to go through also has to do with the social welfare. So from time to time, there has to be monitoring and evaluation. So that's where the major problem is. They are not able to sustain the monitoring and evaluation. But I believe it can get better with time because I believe from, from time to time, they're beginning to realize that a lot of things is happening when it comes to early childhood education, which is not good. So they have to be equally involved as well and be consistent when it comes to the follow up with monitoring and evaluation. And then the third question, which has to do, can you come again with the third question? Um, sure. So that, this one is about, um, is there an ongoing program for collaboration between government and NGOs uh, in order to uh, realize the issue? Yes, yes. Um, so I, I can't speak to um, Ghana Education Service because it's very broad, but when it comes to early childhood education, what I know for sure is that the National Youth Authority have funds that support youth-led projects, especially if you're working on something in the educational factor, um, the educational sector, they're able to support you with funds in your project. So they have some funding system that helps NGOs that is working in different sectors to be able to implement those projects. But we don't, there's no specific programs being run at the ministry level for early childhood education. But I know there are programs that are being run for education in general, but not at least it's not specific. They usually make it very general. So there's no specific program currently when it comes to early childhood education. Sure, thank you, Janet. I'll give it to Oladi uh, for, what, for the question. Then also we have one more question coming. Then we'll go back to the questions after you answer Oladi. Right, uh, thank you for the question, FWM. Yes, um, before I ventured into educational advocacy, I'd always had this mindset that perhaps there was a general disinterest on the part of the children. That is, maybe they are the one that don't want to go to school or what have you. But when I started, you know, examines and everything, I got to understand that the major challenge is affordability. That is the number one challenge. Because when we call for free tutorials or what have you, you will see crowd about 200 participants, 150 participants. So that signals that, the challenge is not about people's interests, but rather about you providing the structure for them and, of course, making it very much accessible. So that was one striking thing I was able to pinpoint um, you know, by advancing Excel Minds. Thank you. Sure. Um, so I'll give it to Anita, who raised her hand before. So uh, then I'll then also uh, ask you, Peter had also one question. Okay, Anita is saying she can also write it, so please. Okay, go ahead, Anita. Right. Okay, no, no worries. <laughs> Thank you, Ephraim. Um, I just want to congratulate uh, the, um, the ambassadors um, for a successful webinar, first of all. And I am in absolute awe of the work that you guys are putting in. And um, I'm absolutely inspired by your commitment to the advancement of human rights, um, because education is a basic human right. And now for my question um, to both of you guys. Um, seeing the recent um, events, particularly in Nigeria, we read beginning of the year about the school kids that were abducted. Um, yeah, so what solutions would you guys have? I know this is a difficult question. What solutions would you guys have to, um, to, to suggest or give out to protect and, and, and ensure security um, for children at, at schools? Because I know you're going to school, you are sort of, um, you know, you, you, you expect schools to be the last place where you feel um, insecure, you know, where you feel like 
um, you are unsafe. So what, what solutions or recommendations would you, would you guys have um, to ensure security and, and um, peace for children at, at schools? Okay, sure. All right. Uh, yeah. Th uh, thank you very much for the question, Anita. Yes, you are very correct. That's a very, very difficult question. In fact, it's it's a security question and an illiteracy question combined. Yes, but if we are to look at the root causes of terrorism or whether view, of course, illiteracy is part of it. You know, when people don't go to school, they tend to become easily radicalized. But to answer your question about, okay, how can students, how can we get um, children to school or how can they go to school despite the security situation? For me, I would strongly advise for virtual teaching that is online learning because it's, it's not logical for you to ask children to go to school. No matter the number of army personnel you station in those schools, it is not, it's not a sustainable solution. And the insecurity situation we have in Nigeria today is not something that can be eradicated even within one year. It is something that has gone to the root. So what our advice is that children should learn from home. There should be virtual teaching from home. And by so doing, I think that that would to a large extent um, allay your fears. Thank you very much. All right, thank you, Shotun Dave, for your view. Um, so I will speak in terms of little children because I work with little kids. So in our school, what we do to secure, um, to make sure there's security is that we have a system. When the kids come to school, we have a bus that picks the kids to school. And so we know the number of kids in a school each day. And then we don't allow kids to move out because we have a tight security system that doesn't allow kids to go outside the school premises. And when it is closing, we expect, we have database of all the parents and all the parents are located somebody who comes to pick them if the children are not taking our bus. So if any different person comes in that you want to pick the child, there's no way we are going to allow you to pick that child up until that particular person allocated to pick the child is in. So this ensure, like this help us to be able to ensure security for the kids. So when the kid is in the house, whatever happens in the house is beyond, you know, we can't control that. But as long as we are within the school internally, we can use some of these measures to mitigate, to mitigate the issue of getting kids, you know, kidnapped or all those things. So maybe school schools should try and adopt a very secure security system by maybe implement. I know schools implement some of these um, principles, but they should try their best to make sure they are strict on it because sometimes it can get very confusing when it comes to parents, schools, teacher, you know, those relationships. So this is what we use in our school to secure security for our kids. Thank you. Sure. Uh, thanks, both of you. Uh, I'll speak one question, then um, I think we're running out of time. So a question from Peter. African governments still have the power on policies of education, and how can we use the outline solutions to promote early childhood education in large scale and not be stopped or intimidated by this government? So I believe the question uh, is more of how advocacy and promotion, how can we advocate the issue of child, early childhood education uh, on a larger scale level? So um, feel free to answer uh, Janet or Oladibo or both of you. So I will start first. So what we are doing with our project, even though our project is really segmented and is centered on Kokobite, this particular community, we try our best to organize like um, quarterly webinars online to advocate the importance of early childhood education. We don't really limit it to one community. So I believe that advocacy is the key thing if we want to get this, um, we want to get a lot of people believe in early childhood education. Advocacy is key. Aside the other policies, because in Ghana, we have a policy that every um, child, kindergarten child should be in school. So from four years to five years, you must be in school. But there are no policies when it comes to the nursery aspects. And so there are just a bit of gaps in that. When it, there's just a lot of things to talk when it comes to inequalities with early childhood education. There's just so many things to talk about. But I think as youth leaders and youth advocates, what we can do is continue, persist on promoting, advocating early, importance of early childhood education because people need to understand why there is a need to get their kids educated. If all the right tools are provided and the right institutions are available for them to have access to it. So I believe this should be able to help in promoting it on a larger scale. Yeah, thank you. 
Okay, yeah. All right, thank you very much, um, Peter, for the question, and of course, FM for reiterating. Although my project is not focused on early childhood education, but similarly, I would love to adapt majority of um, the solutions that have been provided by Janet, but I would just love to emphasize that I don't know if it is different in Ghana, but in Nigeria here, yeah, for it to achieve anything, to a large extent, you need to get the input of the government. So we need to work on partnership with the government because they control a lot of things, they control funding, policy approvals, and a whole lot of things. So we need to critically look at how we can work on more partnership with the government and getting them to understand, you know, it should be an all-inclusive thing, getting them to understand how crucial all of these issues are. And of course, I guess we'll go along with that. Thank you. Sure. Um, I see one more question. So at which level COVID-19 has affected early child education in your countries, Nigeria and Ghana? So this can be answered when uh, I'll give you both a minute uh, to make a final remark about uh, what you want to say at the end. And you can also add the COVID-19, how this is affecting the early child education in both countries. Uh, Oladi, you can start. A minute for a final remark. All right. Um, thank you very much for the question. Yes, as we guess how COVID-19 has affected early it has affected, in fact, I, I don't I don't think we need to even consider that it has affected the whole lot of things. You can imagine a country that prior to COVID-19 was not even doing well. I mean, in terms of early childhood education, accessibility, and of course illiteracy or what have you, COVID-19 has further disrupted things. And it has, you know, it has affected a whole lot of things. But I would love to conclude with this, which is what I used to open my um, presentation. There is a need for us to understand that the educational sector is a crucial sector, a sector that stimulates critical thinking. Critical thinking would lead to innovation. And innovation mm -hmm. is what will best the most needed growth and development more in our country, specifically Nigeria. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Shatunde. Um Liana, for your question, yes, uh, COVID has really affected early childhood education in Ghana. Um, I always make reference to our school. Um, prior before COVID started, we could have the whole classroom fold up, but then since COVID started, the parents would be like, oh, I'm scared, you know, maybe the, the protocols are not well observed. You know how kids could be, they can't even exchange their nose mask. So it, it's very, it's been very difficult to keep up with the protocol system. So therefore it has really, really affected early childhood in Ghana and we cannot undermine that aspect. One thing I want to say to everybody is that, like my friend, um, my colleague and friend said, education is very, very important and we cannot overlook the foundation of everything. Early childhood education is the foundation of the whole educational cycle. If you talk about tertiary, if you talk about senior high school, junior high school, without early childhood education, we are missing out on a lot. So let us all, in as much as we focus on every other sector that we have, our focus and vision and mission um, kind of aim that we should try as, as much as possible to be able to include education, especially early childhood education in our advocacies. So that in that way, we believe that everybody will be able to improve in terms of illiteracy in various countries, not just in West Africa. I know it applies to other countries as well. Thank you. Well, uh, that was really wonderful. Thank you very much. I believe we talked about um, the foundation, which is the very important thing, which is early uh, childhood education and illiteracy um, from both countries. So uh, next slide, please. Thank you, our speakers, uh, and uh, for the great presence, presence and participation. And um, I will just take some time, uh, only five minutes, to talk about a youth lead and how um, young people can join and also access these resources. And as you can see, this is uh, the youth lead site on the on the screen uh, on the on the last line. You can see the website. And this, um, if you join the website as a member, you can also uh, post contents, uh, resources like today, uh, webinar announcements, blogs, short videos, uh, events, and also funding opportunities from different um, sectors. And you can also post your projects uh, to showcase your projects, to showcase what you are doing in your local community. And uh, once you start to post on the website, you'll have, uh, you'll earn points and you'll earn badges. And this is considered as a point. 
And an interesting thing is every month, uh, members also get a youth lead news newsletter, which showcases uh, different webinars, uh, opportunities, and events. You can also follow us on our social media, Twitter and Facebook at Youth Lead Global. And above all, you can reach out to the speakers uh, and the, continue the discussion. You can find today's speakers and also other uh, Youth Lead Ambassadors and young change, change makers on the, on the site. So we would like to thank our various sponsors who are promoting Youth Lead to their youth network and contribute uh, and are contributing resources, uh, even in various funding opportunities. And our sponsors are offering their expertise, knowledge on various topics, and we work with them to organize skill building training webinars for our youth lead members. Uh, in the future, in the future, also you'll hear uh, about them. Finally, uh, from my side, I would say uh, thank you very much, and uh, we hope you will join our next webinar, which will be on April twenty third, and it will be on um, gender equality and inclusion the role of youth before and during COVID-19 pandemic. So please check the events on the youthlead.org for new webinar announcements. Uh, and as we said in the beginning, the recording will be available on the youthlead.org site. Uh, until next time, uh, stay safe. Uh, with that, I'll say goodbye. Thank you very much.